Thank you so much, Steve, and our orchestra and choir. What an amazing opportunity to start the weekend with great worship. Well, in case you thought I no longer worked here, my name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at Liberty, and I bring you greetings from the churches that are most affected in the hurricane zone. Uh, our team was down there. You'll hear more about that next week when I'm back to preach. But my assignment this morning is a great one. I get to introduce uh, one of my predecessors. Uh, Bill Jones is back in the house. Can we welcome him back? Amen. And his much better half, Carol, is here with him. And uh, so blessed by their ministry. When I think of Bill Jones, I think of uh, this passage of Scripture. It says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Uh, in Bill's 17 years here, he was certainly, as we look back, uh, known as a builder. Uh, Bill helped to build uh, much of the facility that uh, we use and appreciate every day and have reached thousands of people in northwest Indiana with the gospel because of the facility that is in place. Uh, Bill certainly, and even more importantly than building buildings, uh, Bill built the flock of God. More than doubling the size of the church by God's grace in his tenure here. I think the most important part of Bill's legacy uh, and it's seen in the lives of so many of you, is that Bill built disciples. And he equipped people with the word of God to do the work of God. And we are so grateful. Would you join me in welcoming one of Liberty Bible Church's very best, Bill Jones. Well, thank you for the warm welcome. And Brian, thank you for the privilege of being able to be here. I'm so excited. I don't think anybody is more excited about having you here than I am because of <laughs> the great preaching, the great leadership. I have really enjoyed it. I've had a chance to listen to Brian's messages from afar, and it's just been a thrill. So I can see why you'd be excited to have him here as well. Well, it is so great to be back. Carol, I don't know if you want to, people they don't get a chance to see you, so why don't you stand up real quickly. <laughs> Say hello. And I see that many of you are in the same seats you were in 13 years ago <laughs> when we were here, so that helps. Nice to see you, yes. But I also realize there, there are new faces here. Praise God. And you don't know our story, and even some of you who were here when we were here maybe don't remember my story. So I put together a little video that will give you a sense of my spiritual journey to come to faith in Jesus. So let's go ahead and watch this video. center of Ohio isn't that big of a claim to fame. Anyway, here's my family. My sister Linda is the oldest of the four kids. Then I have an older brother Steve and a younger brother Matt. We always had at least one dog in our household. It was only after I grew up that I realized what a privileged life we had. My parents had a strong marriage and my dad's job as a doctor allowed us to enjoy a lot of material privileges. Whether it was a membership at a local swim and racket club where we spent the summers or dinners at the country club. But we missed the most important thing, a genuine relationship with the Lord Jesus. Now, I grew up going to church, 
but it was a church that didn't really present the gospel. So I assumed that I was a Christian, and a pretty good one at that. I had high morals compared to my classmates, I was a high achiever in school, and I went to church services regularly. During college, Linda, my sister, came home from a summer job and announced that she had become a Christian. And though I saw a change in her life, it didn't really register with me until my junior year in high school. That year, some teammates on the basketball team explained on the bus one night what made them different. And they said the same thing my sister did, that they had a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. So I went home that night and read the only Christian book I thought would interest me. And it wasn't the Bible. It was The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. That book convinced me that Jesus was coming back. And I became seriously concerned that he was not coming back for me. A few months later, I finally settled the issue of what true faith was all about in my own life. A local church sponsored a prayer breakfast for high school athletes in our area, and that morning I heard a couple of Ohio State football players share their faith stories. What they shared lined up exactly with what my sister had told me and my teammates. So on the way out, I picked up a booklet that explained how to trust in Christ, and after school, I knelt down by my bed and asked Christ to be my Savior. After working up the courage, I wrote to my sister at college to tell her and she sent this booklet by John Stott to help me get started as a follower of Christ. She's been an inspiration to me ever since. As some of you have stories that sound like the prodigal son, my story sounds more like the older brother. I sure am thankful that we have a Father in Heaven who is willing to pursue both kinds of brothers that need His grace. God is a God who seeks the lost. And there are people who are lost for all kinds of reasons. And as I thought about the mission that Brian just unpacked for you, that liberty exists to love and to lead all people to life change in Jesus, I couldn't help but think of this passage that we're going to look at today. And if you're a regular at Liberty, this is a familiar passage. But I hope it will provide some fresh insights on where you stand in relationship to God's story and how you can be a part of God's story in a new and powerful way. So I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 15. We're going to read a story that Jesus told. It ties into my story, as you will see from the last graphic that was a part of that little video, but it's going to apply to your story too. I hope you'll see that this morning. Luke 15, starting in verse 11. Jesus said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me, and he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And we might think that was the place where the story should end. But it doesn't end there. 
Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me, and all that I is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Now, rather than just listen to the story, I want to invite you to enter the story with me. And I want you to answer a question as we think back over the story that Jesus told. What does this story tell us about the characters that Jesus puts in the story? And I want you to think of it from a couple of different angles. One angle would be what they were like before the younger son left, and what were they like when the younger son came home. Let's begin with the father. What words would you use to describe the father in the story? He had two sons at home. One was struggling, the other was doing fine. And the younger one comes with this amazing, astonishing request. Give me my part of the inheritance, dad. What was the father like? Here's some words that I thought of. I don't know if they overlap with what you perceive, but I see him as patient, gracious, he's generous, he's loving, almost to the point that you question his judgment. I mean, would we do that? And even after the son leaves, you you see this expectancy. He's watching. There's a longing in his heart. And then after the son comes home, how would you describe him? I mean, he looks like the same guy, doesn't he? He's here, are the characteristics. He's forgiving. He, he celebrates. My son is home. And he's generous, just like he was before. It's like, bring the best robe, bring a ring, bring shoes, bring the fattened calf. Let's celebrate. And he is toward the older son the way he was toward this younger son. You see how patient he is, how loving he is, how gracious he is, how winsome he is. And when you look at this man, you can't help but want to be like that. And that's part of the reason Jesus tells the story. So let's move on to the second character, the younger brother. What was he like before he left home. And if you've ever had a prodigal as a parent, you've experienced this, you've lived it. He was restless, he didn't wanna be there. He was selfish, he didn't think about anybody else. And because of that, he was hurtful in the choices that he made, the requests that he asked. And then looking at how he lived his life, he was foolish, he was wasteful, he was self-indulgent, he was reckless. It's not a very pretty picture, but Maybe you've experienced it firsthand and you know what that feels like. But what was he like after he came home? You know, it says he came to himself, something happened inside of him and he changed. I I see him later as someone who is humble, someone who is repentant, someone who isn't quite sure what's waiting for him at home because he knows he's not worthy even to be a servant in his dad's house and yet he knows it's Really, the only place he has a hope, it's to go home. And so he goes home with some hesitancy, but then he finds he's embraced, he's celebrated, he is, ultimately, he's got to be surprised. He didn't expect this. And then think of the third son, or the third character, the second son. 
He's the older one. And when you think of describing him before his brother leaves, you, you think of this very admirable young man. He's compliant, he's obedient, he's responsible, he's outwardly respectful, he's hardworking. I mean, he's the kind of kid that would have won the award for most likely to succeed in high school because he does the right stuff. But something happens in this young man when his brother comes home. There is as big a change in his life as there is in his younger brother's life. He becomes sullen. He's disrespectful now. He's judgmental toward his brother and toward his father. You, you hear a tone of self-righteousness in his voice. He's resentful, he's angry, he's arrogant, he's proud. And essentially, that's what's been under the surface in this young man's life all along. So we've entered into the story, but it's not just enough to hear it and know it a little bit better. We need to understand it. Why did Jesus tell this story? And why did Luke alone record this story among all the gospel writers? I mean, this is powerful stuff. If I'd have been writing a gospel, I would have wanted to include this, but Luke seems to have a special emphasis that we'll see. Why did Jesus tell it? All we have to do is read the beginning verses of this chapter. Take a look at chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. Very important biblical word. Because whenever you see it popping up, it's not a very pretty picture. They grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So why did Jesus tell the story? Because this grumbling is going on all around him. I mean, from the very beginning of his ministry, the wrong kind of people have been streaming toward Jesus. And this group, the, the older son group, the self-righteous group has been looking and saying, I can't believe this guy hangs around with people like this. Holy people don't do that. And yet Luke, all along in his gospel, has been telling us, this is the mission of Jesus. This is why Jesus came. So Luke tells us about one of Jesus' first messages. He was in his home synagogue in Nazareth. They gave him the scroll to read from the scriptures, and he read from Isaiah, and this is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And when Jesus finished reading that, he said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He said, this is why I came. I came to bring God's favor. Favor for those who were blind. Favor for those who were caught. Favor for those who were lost. That's why I came. And yet all along, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law have been muttering and complaining and grumbling about Jesus reaching out to people who had an obvious need. I mean, take a look at this passage. We'll go on to the, the next slide. The Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples. There's a, a pattern here in Luke's gospel saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And then Jesus gets a dinner invitation by one of the Pharisees over to his house. His name is Simon. This is what it says happened there. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, 
he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Can a holy God connect with unholy people? I mean, that's why Jesus came, to open that door. And so, Jesus tells a story in response to the grumbling that's going on. He, he hangs around with these people. He eats with these people. He welcomes these people. And he doesn't tell just one story, the one we read. He doesn't tell just two stories. He tells three stories to get his point across. I mean, let's, let's read back in Luke 15, starting in verse 2. Here's, this, here's the first story he actually tells when he hears the grumbling as Luke records it. So he told them this parable. And as I read these two, I want you to look for patterns, parallels. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. What's the point? Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. He doesn't stop there. Or what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, She calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. What's the point? Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then finally, he tells the story that we read. One after another after another. This must be pretty important. And I think it's important to Jesus because there are three groups of people here that need to hear this story. I think, first of all, of the the sinners and the tax collectors. I mean, this is a group of people who have walked away from the Lord for most of their lives. And they haven't looked back until Jesus showed up. And when they turned back toward Jesus, do you know who was grumbling and complaining about them, saying, you know, you don't belong here. You aren't worthy to be here. Why are you around him? Do you think they needed assurance? I mean, what what was the pattern that you saw in those stories? Something valuable is lost. And there's a great search that goes on to find it. And when it's found, there's a great celebration. Jesus came on a search and rescue mission. And now the celebrations are breaking out in heaven with each one of these sinners that comes back to him. And look who's grumbling all around them. We'll come to that group next because I think there's a second group that needed to hear this story or this set of stories. It was the the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. See, Jesus knew their real, real condition on the outside, they look good, kind of like the, the older brother looked good. But there's a real problem on the inside. They are just as far from God as those who have walked away into blatant sin, and they don't even realize it. They don't even see it. And that can affect us too. I mean, I identify with the older brother. How many of you would say, that was my story before I turned to the Lord? I was like the older brother. How many of you would say that's true of you? How about the younger brother? How many of you just kind of went your own way, did your own thing? Anybody would say that was my story? Okay, we've got a mixture here. Well, there's a third group that needed to hear these stories. It was Jesus' disciples. And of all the groups, they needed to hear it the most. And here's the reason why. Jesus is about ready to take this mission that he had from his father, and he's going to give it to these guys. He says, this is for you. You need to take this now. You need to run with it now. And that's happened in every generation since. The Lord has handed it to you 
through your shepherd, Brian. Liberty exists to love and to lead all people to life change in Jesus. So we're going to deal with some, some challenges. I look at the disciples. Jesus has representatives from both groups. He has a younger brother disciple. His name is Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. And the day came when he decided to leave it all behind and follow Jesus. And the day that he did that, he had a huge party, invited all his tax collector friends because he had never met a religious person like Jesus. Someone who was like the Father. He also had people on the other side, the older brother, Peter. I don't go into all the details to explain this statement, but there was a point in Peter's life where God asked him to cross a boundary that he had never crossed before in his heart. It was an older brother boundary. It was reaching out to Gentile people. And God gave him a vision. In this vision, he responded by saying, God, I have never eaten anything common or unclean in my whole life. He had always kept the kosher laws. Now, this blows my mind. Here is a man, he had never had a strip of bacon in his life. <laughs> really? He had never sampled the shrimp in his life. That's how faithful he was. But it created barriers in his heart that kept him from fulfilling the heart of the Father and the mission of the, of the Lord Jesus. So as we enter the story, as we understand the story, the next question is, how do we live the story? Because we can all identify where we are in this journey just by looking at this one story of Jesus. And I think we can do that by asking this question, where does your story overlap with this story? Where does your story overlap with this story? So I take a look at these two sons, and I think they represent, in general, the sinful human tendency we have in the religious realm as human beings. On the one hand, you have a son who says, I can't keep all these rules. I don't care about all those rules. I'd rather just go do my own thing, live my own life my own way. And you know people like that. I know people like that. And some of you were like that. You may be like that today. Then you have people on the other side. They are really fervent about their religious faith. And so they practice their faith. They obey the rules. They're compliant, obedient type people. But why? It's so that they can build up their own merit, their own righteousness, their own standing, their own sense of favor before God. It's a scary position to be in. So as I looked at these two groups, the group that wandered away, the group that kind of stayed at home but had a sort of self-righteous attitude, I began to think, now, which group would you think would be more likely to, to come to Jesus, this, the holiest of holies, when he showed up? The one with pure truth. Wouldn't you think it would be the group that had been the rule-keeping, Bible-memorizing, synagogue-attending faction? Wouldn't they be excited? And we see the answer is no. It was this group that seemed more attracted to Jesus. And I began to think, well, why? What's going on here? Well, then I look at what Luke and the other gospel writers say about the message of Jesus. And they sum it up in one phrase, one sentence. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent means you need to turn from your way to God's way. You need to turn from what's pulling you to God. And to this group over here, the younger brother group, well, they've tried their way. They realize it doesn't work. They realize it's too late to make themselves look good in God's eyes. They realize they're not even worthy to be called his slave. But this offers genuine hope. It doesn't depend on them. It depends on God. This is grace. To this group, 
They've spent their whole lives trying to build a resume of righteousness before God. And the reason they've done that is so they don't have to repent. So this message of Jesus, it was hope to this group. It was a threat to this group. And I think that, at least for me, explains why they would react the way that they do. So let's, let's talk about where we live in relationship to this. If you are here today and you identify with the younger son and you haven't turned yet to Jesus, I bet you're here because you've been forced to be here. Because you don't find people like that just show up on Sunday mornings in churches. You know, your mom or dad dragged you here or your husband or wife dragged you here. But I can guarantee you, you've never encountered someone like Jesus. And this open arms that he has, if you will turn to him and humble yourself before him and allow him to give you a fresh start. I don't know what it will take, how God will open your eyes, but you, I pray, someday will come to your senses like this young man and realize my only hope is at home with the Lord. And if you haven't taken that step yet, I hope that you'll do it today. In fact, you can do it while I keep preaching. That's more important than anything else I'm going to have to say. You may be over on this side because churches are great places for older brothers. You come here and you learn about the rules and there are rituals that you can follow and there are regulations for you to obey and you can begin to build your resume of righteousness. And you can become self-righteous and judgmental, and resentful, just like the older brother. So, if you come out of an older brother mindset like I did, how do you know whether you've actually turned or not toward the Lord? Well, I think we can know by recognizing that the time comes for both sinners, when they turn, to not only receive grace and forgiveness from God, but to extend grace and forgiveness from God to others. You see, we all tend to like to hang around with the people that are like us. Who did the tax collectors and sinners hang around with? Other tax collectors and sinners. Who did the Pharisees and teachers of the law hang around with? Other Pharisees and teachers of the law. Who did Jesus hang around with? Everybody. Everybody and anybody who would come. And I look at the mission that you have to lead and to love all people to the life changing in Jesus. Jesus died for all kinds of people. And as you see your heart resonating more and more with the heart of the Father, where you see God's grace, God's generosity, God's patience, God's longing, God's hunger, when you see the value in other people that Jesus sees, when you are waiting for them to make that turn while you're patient, while you're winsome, then you know that you're on the pathway that God has for all of us as followers of Jesus. And the more that story becomes our story, the more you will see this story here at Liberty Bible Church. You will see younger brothers coming home and older brothers being reconciled with their father. My great concern right now for the church that I see in America is too much of the voice of the older brother speaking about the younger brothers that are around us. And when we hear that in our heads, What we need to do is remember these three stories. God looks at those people and he loves them. He treasures them. God looks at those people and he seeks after them. And when they turn, he celebrates. Let's pray. Lord, no one knows expresses holiness like you do. No one has a reason to pull back from people like us more than you do. 
And yet because of how you value us, because of the nature of your grace and your mercy, you pursue us. And I thank you that you have a plan not only to pursue us, not only to forgive us, but you have a plan to transform us as followers of Jesus. Lord, I pray that Liberty Bible Church will become a place where that transformation is evident, where it is lived out every day here in the ministries of this church, in the homes that are represented here, in the neighborhoods, in the workplaces, that when people think of Liberty Bible Church, they see the qualities of the Father. Thank you, Lord, that you understand our tendencies. You know how we're wired. You know our weaknesses. You know our temptations and our failures. And we thank you that you always stand ready to welcome us, embrace us with open arms to forgive us and cleanse us and give us a fresh start. And Lord, I, I pray especially for anyone who's here, younger brother or older brother who has never turned. And if today in your mercy you have opened their eyes, I pray that they would simply say to you, Lord, I'm, I'm coming home. I'm turning to you. I'm doing that right now in my heart. And I thank you for sending your son to be the way, the truth, and the life so that I can know you as my heavenly father. And Lord, if that hasn't happened now, I pray that it will happen soon. In the name of the one you sent to seek and to save us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's respond, singing a closing prayer together. Let's stand. closing prayer that we would know your purposes that we would, you would fulfill your purposes through us for your glory amen mm -hmm.